Everything looks better with a dram in your hand. Hello and welcome to the Cask 88 Lock-In, episode 10. As many episodes now as I have fingers, and that has got to be significant. What better way to celebrate our first decaversary than by revealing an announcement that we've been sitting on for a little while now. The revelation of the third in our Scottish folklore series of bottlings. Now this roiling nuisance of a pandemic has gotten in the way of this somewhat, but we're almost ready to reveal this hotly anticipated new bottle to the world. Some may remember our Scottish folklore series. We have two bottles in it so far. The Ben Nevis that we scaled the mountain to track down the elusive Kushi, and when we scouted the Isle of Arran for our mysterious and beautiful Selkie. And the third figure of folklore is currently waiting patiently underneath this blanket. But before I introduce it, I'd like to introduce you to the man who made it all possible. Our researcher in the field, our storyteller extraordinaire, Storyteller Sam. Hmm, thank you, thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Indoors. My god, what the f*** is that on your face? Gravitas. I figured you wouldn't recognise it. Would you even recognise yourself? Do they have mirrors in the wilderness? Says the man who's ashamed to show his chin to the world. I don't think you understand how shame works. Would you like me to tell you about the research I've done for this bottle? Not really. But, since that is the format, I will abide. I've scoured the length and breadth of Scotland in search of the stories that bring us all together. I've conversed with the beasts of the land, the sea, the air, to discover which of their masters is truly worthy of our patronage. Oh, so you did interviews? Okay, well that I can understand. And you took a camera with you? Of course. I'm no Luddite. I don't know what you are. But okay, this is a format I can work with. You do the interviews that teach us about the folklore, I'll do the interviews that teach us about the whiskey. And we combine our powers to reveal the Scottish Folklore third edition in the final climactic scene? If you like. Okay, I'll go and get ready for my first interview and you do yourself a favour. Go and look in a mirror. You look like a communist. Yeah, yeah. On with the show. For visionary people, there must be two ways of viewing the world either quiet satisfaction that their ideas have proved to be good over time, or frustration at the rest of us for always being a little slow to catch up. My next guest, Caroline Dewar, joined the whiskey industry in the 1980s and has a history of developing good ideas long before they become received wisdom. She was an early proponent of the single malts, was responsible for the first set of official tasting notes, developed the Friends of Lefroy fan club, and has long talked about the virtues of pairing food and whiskey together. Naturally, it's also wonderful to have someone with such a connection with the Laphroaig distillery on the show so we can learn a bit more about the place that made the whisky we chose for the third in our Scottish folklore series. Caroline Dewar, welcome. Thank you. Your whisky journey started in the 1980s with uh, William Teacher and Sons. Now, did you have a love for whisky before you joined the company or is that something that grew over time? Oh, it grew very fast. Um, I joined Teachers from an advertising agency. I thought when I left university that I wanted to work in advertising. Teachers had an ad in the paper for an assistant brand manager for Europe and a few weeks later had a job. When I joined Teachers, it was to look after teachers in Europe. Uh, the malts bit came a little later on. Yeah. At what sort of point did the, did, the sing, did the focus start to shift towards the single malt? Um, Mid to late 80s, I would say, um, we felt that we needed to do more with the Glendronach. It was kind of being sold on the back of teachers because it was part of, it was used in the teacher blend along with Ardmore and and many other things. And I was given the task of basically bringing it on. And in the first year, we doubled its sales. Um, But we had a lot of work to do before we got to that that stage, developing the brand's identity, its packaging, um, what the offering itself was. We actually had two styles to start with, Glendronach Original and Glendronach Sherry Cask, um, and let them find their own way in each market. As I sort of said in my, in, in my introduction, you had a, a way of sort of sniffing out these trends that looked like they were really going somewhere. So I wonder if um, now, you know, there are other trends of uh, which, which may be about to grow and other things that may have been traditionally overlooked, like for example, grain whiskey which is finding its feet in recent years 
So to help those who would like to make grey whiskey a thing, would you share some of the challenges you had in communicating the virtues of single malts to a public who may have still been slightly suspicious of them? I think people by that time, we're talking about late 80s, beginning of the 90s, people were already being becoming receptive uh, and maybe looking for a next step or a challenge themselves. In a way, it was uh, there was a bit of preaching to the almost converted. It was good targeting via good distributors. They knew the people that they wanted to get to. As a group, we developed the promotional materials that we wanted the distributors to use. And we had good distillery stories as well. And um, taste, taste, taste is an important thing. We bought Long John, so we acquired Lafroy and our at that time as well. Um, the agency had a chat with the manager at Lafroy, who's a, a wonderful man called Ian Henderson, who was there for quite a long time. And they came up with this idea, Friends of Lafroy, to make consumers feel that they were actually attached and, and belonged to the brand. And then the square foot of Lafroy idea. But the square foot thing was what then really took it off because um, we, we had thousands of friends of Lafroy. And I do mean thousands. Um, but the square foot took it on ages further. And we now, I shouldn't say we anymore, but old habits die hard, I have to say. Um, there are now getting on for 900,000 friends of Lafroy out there. But the, the great thing about the square foot as well is that people feel so so tied to the brand and the island that they come to visit. We've had people propose on their square foot. We've had people get married on their square foot. It's, it's just a terrific story to tell. Hmm. And it's so apt as well, almost for Lafroy to have a square foot of land because Lafroy is known also for just being such an earthy, peaty, sometimes challenging to drink, but always incredibly full-bodied whiskey. Do you have a soft spot yourself for this style of, uh, of Isla PT earthy whiskey? Oh yes, I mean, I have a soft spot for all of the Isla whiskies and Jura as well. I mean, I, I love them all. There are some expressions that I like better than others, but such is life. Yeah, Lafroig is something you need to try more than once to, to get to grips with it, to appreciate it. I was, I was 19 when I tried my first Lafroig and that was actually one of my first whiskies. And we did, we did not get on well. Since then, Lafroy and I are now firm friends. I'm delighted with this new Lafroy that is going to be, you know, uh, our our folklore series Lafroy. No troubles with the flavour of that whatsoever. I've been completely won over. And this one happens to be 19 years old as well, so there's a kind of circularity to everything. I saw that uh, you were part of, well, developing the art of using tasting notes in whiskey, which actually is quite a recent phenomenon as well. Um, how was it that that got started? Tasting notes. Well, um, I had been fortunate in that the marketing director I worked for at Teachers, he recognised and had come from a different part of the company himself into the whisky side. Um, and we had a whole load of different drinks products within the company, which was Allied Lions to begin with, and then became Allied Distillers later. And, and I said I was interested in wines. And he said, well, we own wines, we own sherry, you know, other things. Um, the Wine and Spirit Education Trust run courses, you go and do the courses, pass the exams and we'll pay. So I learned to write a tasting note doing that. that. That's how I came to write the tasting notes. We were going to launch our little malt company, the Caledonian Malt Whiskey Company. And I was asked, since I had this experience, would I write tasting notes for our brands that we had? So I sat down, wrote tasting notes. They were fairly top line because what I didn't want to do, what we didn't want to do, was be too forceful and prescriptive in what was said about the whiskies. So give people a general idea and let them formulate their own words and their own ideas. And that's what I still like to do as well. But certainly in that first instance, we didn't want to be too detailed about it and let people run with their own, their own imaginations as well. That has absolutely happened. So you can see now in the sort of the modern world of single malts, imaginations have absolutely bloomed. Are there any um, are there any sort of new trends shuffling around in whiskey that maybe some of us haven't noticed that you that have caught your eye and you think, aha, maybe this is heading somewhere? Well, there's the interest, which of course um, I think 
I could say was kick-started or made more noticeable to me by Brooklady when they started experimenting with different barley strains. It, it is an area of interest. I mean, maybe yeast is another one that people could look at. Well, I'm interested in finding out. Let's let's put it that way. Are you running anything online that people might be able to get involved with during this time? Um, I am writing my twice monthly column for the Whiskey Ambassador, um, but I'm not doing anything uh, on video as you are doing. But I think it's good that all these things have had to develop because I think they will continue um, even after we're all, you know, out of house arrest and all the rest. Of it. Um, so um, what you're doing and what I've seen from other people, um, some of the distillers are doing themselves, are, are great fun and long may it carry on. Caroline Dewar, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm here in the wilderness of the Scottish Highlands as I was over two years ago, scrambling the sides of Ben Nevis when we tracked down the whisky that we used for the first in our Scottish Folklore series and also when I met an old friend. One, two. You again? Ah, Kushi, it's wonderful to see you again. You're looking magnificent. I know. But flattery alone doesn't curb my hunger. It's well for you that I've recently eaten. What do you want? Well, Cask 88 are releasing another whiskey. Ah, and you want another image of me to enchant people into buying more bottles? Huh, very cunning. Uh, actually, we're releasing a Laphroaig this time. Laphroaig? Phew, that stuff makes my hair stand on end. Ben Nevis is much more my jam. Literally. More floral, more delicate, much more sweeter on the palate. Woof. Well, so can you advise me? Who holds that kind of power? Someone more powerful than me? Yes, I know of one. She cavorts in summer and rules in winter. She raised these mountains herself to serve as stepping stones across her realm. She carves these glens with her hammer and filled these locks when she needs a drink. The shrouded one. This time of year, you'll find her by the sea. I think. By the, by the sea? But I've just climbed all this way. And now you'll have to head back down again. You should have known this job wasn't just sitting around in comfortable chairs, drinking excellent whiskey. Uh, the things I do for whiskey. And get rid of those mutton chops. You look like a fool. You're a dog. What would you know about it? Indecisive humans. Half bald, half fluffy. Disgrace to the mammals, if you ask me. If you all weren't so delicious, I'd wash my paws of the lot of you. The power that good whiskey holds is to bring people together in mutual appreciation. The same is true of good music. I'd now like to introduce someone who knows both perspectives intimately well. As a musician, Linny Carson is all about bringing folk together in joyous live celebrations of music. And as a whiskey nerd, Linny has brought fans of the malts together over whiskey tastings set to music. As we're about to release a bottle that celebrates the overlap between whiskey and folklore, it's great to talk to a talent who's at the overlap between live music and whiskey. Linny Carson, welcome. Hello, Sam. It's lovely to be here. So, yeah, so uh, it's really nice to have you on because uh, as well as um, singer songwriter of really nice kind of come together bringing people together music you're also quite into your whiskies yeah i'm and i don't know if it's a bad thing to say but i'm kind of all about breaking down the barriers that surround whiskey a lot of the time but i came to scottish single malts through bourbon a classic musician's drink it's been so exciting uh, to be involved in the industry and i'm really excited about trying to get young people into whiskey and also women, uh, particularly as well. I've got a wee bit more knowledge than I than I did when I first started. I just kind of fell into it, figured out myself what I liked and didn't like. And so now it's really nice to meet people at the start of their whiskey journey and help them figure out what their taste is. Like any good whiskey, your music is uh, made greater by summing together its component parts. Uh, you know, a good riff delivering some mellow spice, some multi drum beats, uh, smooth warming vocals pull the whole thing together. Actually, how does whiskey and your music come together? 
not looking for tenuous links. I think there's lots of links between music uh, and whiskey. For me, there's a shared experience of them both. You know, there's nothing better than standing at a, a bar with your nearest and dearest and, you know, chewing the fat over a dram or sitting by a fire by, you know, with your closest people uh, enjoying a whiskey. Same with music for me, the, in a live context, that's what it's the most exciting. And that's because you're sharing it with, you know, thousands of other people, you know, is there a better feeling than singing along to your favourite band with a bunch of strangers? Uh, I don't think there is, but, uh, you know, when it gets down to the nitty gritty of it, I think the way music and, and whiskey are made are actually really similar as well. And in terms of you look at the component parts, you know, for a single malt, you've got water, malted barley and yeast, and look at all the different varieties that we have uh, of whiskey out of those three component parts. And it's the same with a band, you know, drums, bass, guitar, vocals, and yet, you know, there is an infinite uh, uh, variation in, in musical styles out there. You can geek out over the technical aspects. You can spend hours reading and analyzing and you'll get loads of great stuff, but you still won't quite figure out what brings them together. You can't quite say what makes a great song. You can't say what's happening in a cask that's making that whiskey suddenly click. Exactly, because it's not formulaic. As soon as you try to follow a formula in, in recording a song, it, it often can lose something. There's lots of happy accidents that, that, that happen when you're recording that, that oftentimes end up being the best part of a song or the best part of an album. You mentioned that um, whiskey is great for bringing people together uh, as is music. Is that something you actively aim for in your own music, sort of to be able to bring people together? I know you've composed uh, kind of a, a football anthem uh, yourself. Oh yeah, uh -huh, uh -huh. Is, is this like uh, something that you really aim for quite a lot? Yeah, I, I don't know if it's a kind of classic Scottish slash West of Scotland Glaswegian thing either, but there's, especially in a live context, uh, the important thing is that people are enjoying themselves, you know, and I grew up in a family where people would have a drink at, at uh, Christmas, at parties, and you would do a turn and, it's, you know, you get up and you would sing a song or do a poem, whatever, and it's all about enjoyment, collective uh, enjoyment, you know, and being a football fan in Scotland, yeah. <laughs> you have to find enjoyment somewhere other than results. <laughs> and so it's definitely part of our national identity I think is that uh, coming together to sing, to have a drink, to have a good time, doesn't actually matter what the outcome is, uh, it's about that collective experience so I mean certainly for the World Cup song that was absolutely on my mind, let's bring everybody together, I wanted to, the country to know the names of those players by the end of, of that World Cup and um, so it absolutely was about positivity, about taking part. And actually you have a new album coming on the 3rd of July is it? Yeah. Um, so exciting. since people probably can't head to the record shops just now, uh, <laughs> where and how will people be able to get hold of the new album? We're doing a digital release first off. We'll then uh, do a CD press uh, and hopefully, fingers crossed, get some vinyl for this one. Nice. Uh, we'll then tour the album once the, the venues are, are open. Uh, that's the plan. And uh, you'll be able to buy the, the physical copies at gigs. We asked you to uh, perform a song for us here on air. So what have you chosen and what was it that made you choose it? Well, I thought I would choose something in keeping with this Glasgow tradition of, you know, you work all week and then you look forward to your Friday night. Uh, back in the day, it would be going out to the dancing and you'd try and meet somebody. And it's called the Cod Liver Oil and the Orange Juice. And it recounts going to the dancing in Deniston. Lenny Carson, thank you so much. And yeah, take it away. Thank you, Sam, and thanks so much for having me.
recognise you, your pals with my old friend the Selkie. Aye, and I recognise you. Questionable grooming habits and hunters too many questions. <laughs> well, as a matter of fact... Here we go. I was uh, up Ben Nevis, I was talking with Ku Shi. He said there's a creature more powerful than himself and she's spending the summer here. Do you know her? Aye, I know her. But it's no yet time for her to visit the Corrie Vrekin off Isla. At this time of year, she's gate busy enjoying life to worry about ruling over this place. So she's not here? Ah, she is if she wants to be. She's all around us. I'm sure if you're talking about her, she'll soon make an appearance. Uh, how will I recognise her though? You'll know. How? What does she look like? I told you, she's all around us. She's here already. <sighs> oh, I see. What's going on? A bit of drizzle. I thought she was all powerful. Oh. Okay, point taken. Perhaps a bit early in the year, but I'm not one to argue with a goddess. Truly a fitting inspiration for this wild and untamable Lefroig. What did you say her name was? Kalik Bira. Is that clear enough, or do I have to spell it out any more to get through all that fluff? Yeah, just one. How come you're not getting wet? <laughs> the whiskey that we chose for this folklore bottle is a hardy Isla staple, Lefroig. And who better than an Iliach to teach us more about this magical Hebridean island and its whiskies? Rachel McNeil is the founder of the Isla Whiskey Academy, where she uses her in-depth knowledge of the whisky microcosm on Isla to teach broader lessons about the truth of all Scotch whisky. Not only has Rachel agreed to help me learn a little more of what's under the hood of these enigmatic island whiskies, but she's also going to be one of the first to taste the actual 19-year-old Laphroaig that represents the Calachbera with me. So I'd best head over to my tasting table. Rachel McNeil, uh, thank you so much for joining us direct from Isla. It's lovely to be here, Sam. Isla itself, it's, it's a region that really 
gets whiskey enthusiasts properly enthused. Uh, and this is, you know, it's quite a small island, but there's so much whiskey concentrated on it, so many distilleries, so much history. What is it about Isla, you think, that makes it so special to whiskey drinkers? Well, there's two reasons, Sam. One is the calibre of our whiskey and the, the range of our whiskey, and the other is also the island itself. I think um, because you have to make a pilgrimage to come to Isla, you've got to drive down to Cana Creek, then come over on the ferry. But then as you drive, as the ferry's coming into Port Ellen, you can see our Bay, Lagavulin and Lafroy, you sail past them uh, from the ferry. So an expectation is built up before you've even arrived here. It's um, people, people relate to it. So it's like Isla's cute. So people, people enjoy this. And then they've got the lovely distilleries all within a short space of each other. And you yourself, uh, you were born nearby on Oronsi uh, and have lived most of your life on Isla. So how is it to see an entire year through on the small island? What's the passage of seasons like there? Well, in the winter, it's very wild. We're washed by the North Atlantic Drift, which is a tributary of the Gulf Stream. So Isla is not uh, cold per se, but what you get is in the winter you get wind chill because you've got 3,000 miles of Atlantic and the, and the winds and the weather comes over the sea like that. So it, so it can be very cold and very, very wild. But when the winter goes and it starts, the spring starts coming and the summer, I mean, it's just delightful. There's, there's no place like it. The Hebrides are just Hebridean Caribbean. About 10 years ago, you started the Isla Whiskey Academy. So what was your goal there and how maybe has that changed over time? I started really um, bringing people to Isla and showing them the distilleries. And then I realized that when I was driving them around, I was really teaching them quite a lot and putting many things in context and connecting all the distilleries to each other for the people to understand the, the differences and the, the compare and the con contrast. I decided that I wanted to offer education on a more formal level. So we started uh, running a thing called the Isla Whiskey Academy Diploma, and people can come to Isla, and uh, it's a residential course, and you stay for uh, five days, and you learn in depth in the morning, technical, theoretical learning lectures. And then in the afternoon, we go to a distillery and we focus on something that ties in. So if, we, if we're learning about peat and malting in the morning, so then in the afternoon, we would obviously go to like Lafroig or Bumod or Kilhoman and the distillery manager and the master blended will take you through all afternoon and really in depth teach you in a practical sense all the theory that you learned in the morning. So, so it's very popular and um, people come from all over the world. We've got industry people, enthusiasts, we've even got beginners who just want to learn more and it's, it's becoming a passionate hobby. So it's the level of education is very high, but it's up to you how much you engage it's up to you how you, what you take from it. Has it been able to adapt itself to current situations? Is the Academy still continuing now? Uh, yes, uh, what's happening now uh, is a very exciting development, Sam. We have created an online course called Whiskey Affinity, which will, it's very exciting, which will launch um, in a few weeks. It means that you can let, it's not just about the Isla distilleries, it's about whisky and whisky production in the whole of Scotland, but the ethos of, of it is it's Scotch in context. So we're going to teach people um, not things in isolation, but how they are connected to the country of Scotland and the culture and history and how Scotch grew out of that. Uh, a couple of years ago at Cask 88, we um, started getting in really interesting in independent bottling and finding, you know, since we know uh, how to find really wonderful casks of whiskey, sometimes we want to put those whiskies into a bottle and have a really exciting independent release. And one of the first we had 
was this, the Kushi, the 45-year-old Ben Nevis, which we followed up with the 22-year-old Aaron, the Selkie. So these are both demonstrating uh, Scottish folklore. Some of the myths, legends, you know, are very much a part of the land, as are the whiskies. And we're now almost ready, almost ready, to reveal to the world our third in the folklore series. And it's very much in your wheelhouse. It's a Lefroy. One of these from the distillery that's famed for that kind of very oceanic, very peaty, quite sort of these all very organic flavors, which can be a little challenging at first, but I'm excited to see my first sample of, of this one. Prior to the 10 minutes in the glass, it had uh, 19 years in the casks. Um, the classic Lefroy start of a bourbon barrel, and then the transfer for the last stage of maturation to the, the red wine. Uh, it's still at almost 54%, uh, this sample, so it's, it's cask strength of 53.9. Let's go very fast, legs. Oh, let's have a looky. And it's, you know, it's got nice oily, and you can see the band of gold floating on it there. Looks like a wee rim of silicon. That's its own wee band of gold. It does, yeah, this, yeah that's, that is a little oily, isn't it? But that's, that's what I would expect from a Laphroaig as, as I know it. So there's a soft, woody, peaty tinge tang to it. Mm -hmm. Now I've got here red wine, so you could, I could smell, I could, it could actually smell red wine. Uh, I've got green gauges. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And also, um, I don't know if you've ever had uh, mackerel, fish mackerel. So you, you cook it on the on a on a little fire on the beach, and then you open it, and you've got this lovely uh, white white meat, like ba it's baked. You bake it in tin foil. So I got this lovely smell of the the white meat, the the so it's of the mackerel. Interesting combinations. I've managed I've managed to do mackerel on my home grill, but I think the beach adds a little extra to it. That's your salty tongue. Well, your health, Slange. Slange. Amazing tannins at the front. Very, very drying at the front. And then you've got like a kind of, um, you've got the oily body at the back, you're going down your, so it's not dry, you're going down your throat, but you've got the, the tannins and the high ABV right at the front. There's a nice warmth down into the chest as well, Sam. But you can still feel it. It's got a, what do you call it, potent mouthfeel. Whiskey's like music, you know, like a symphony. So you've got, you've got your band, your band, or your musicians playing. But then you'll have an instrument that'll come in and play something like that to add texture and timbre. And your whiskey's exactly the same. It, it, it does feel it does feel like all the, the I see what you mean about the different sort of motifs coming in, but they're pretty harmonious. I've no, known some whiskies where something hits you and then something else hits you and these there's very strong flavors and they're wonderful because everything's kind of competing for your attention. Here it just sort of feels they're all flowing in the same line. Yeah, the the, the fruity, the slightly salty and the the metallic minty. It's some do you put water. Did you just put water? Just in the splash, yeah. Much sweeter after water. It's still a little peaty, sort of cinder toffee, blackened, blackened toffee. But the, yeah, it's it's, it's not it's not over dark the caramel now. I guess the most important question though, did you like it? Yes, I liked it. <laughs> yes, I liked it. It's a bit strong, high ABV for me, so maybe I would need to put water in it. And then that's that's something we really should encourage that everyone. There's no prescriptive way to drink whiskey. You find the way that works for you. And it's important, I think, to spend time with your dram. <laughs> That's a good thing, I suppose. Hmm. <laughs> it's, quite, it's, it's, quite, it's gotten quite lively after water. There's the sort of, um, f uh, what do they call like, you know, you know when you compress those bits of dried fruit into a sort of leathery strip, um, the fruit. Oh, like, yes, yes, uh -huh. it comes alive. Hmm. Mm -hmm. But maybe at the cost of a little peatiness, which is interesting, because sometimes water takes the peat levels right up there. <laughs> it's very interesting though because you see independent bottles or independent bottlings are not the character of the distillery, they're the character that the independent bottlers chosen them to be. Independent bottlers have their own style, the same way a distillery has a house style, independent bottlers have a house style. Mm -hmm. That's why independent bottlings are very interesting because what's happening here is we're actually expanding the circle 
you're giving it another another um, another arena mm-hmm. to the experiences that we can have from one distillery. All power to independent bottlers. <laughs> oh, yeah, it, it, interesting because I think that we are still new enough at independent bottling that maybe our style hasn't quite settled. I guess it's the preferences of um, of you know our founders who choose the casks. That's our style. What they like is what goes into the cask, but well, what they like is, is, is pretty classy, according to this. <laughs> it's very modish, Sam. It, it is. I, I, I do, big, you should have saved me a bigger bottle. We were talking <laughs> about taking our time, but uh, yeah, mm-hmm. there, there's a way of making the whiskey last longer, and that's, that's to, to, to send you more of it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I guess that's also the thing about these sort of independent single cask releases is there just isn't that much of it. You know, this is a one shot. There will never be another one that's exactly like this. Um, well, that's the, that's the fantastic thing about it because whiskey is a performance. Mm. And when you drink it, you're engaging in that performance. And I love one off. I love single casks. Mm. I love when it's gone. You know, it's, <laughs> it's so ethereal, so magic. It makes you become in the moment when you're drinking it, you pay attention because you can't just go and get it again. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, so I find that very interesting. I like that aspect of single cask. I think I think there's something beautiful in the things that will not last, and you have to grab them and enjoy them while you can. This was this was a great pleasure, Rachel McNeil. Thank you so much for doing this tasting with me. Thank you very much, Sam. I've had a lovely time. Me too. Absolute pleasure. And so now it's finally time to unveil the fruits of our labours. This assertive, joyous, but also dangerous bottle of Laphroaig. Inspired by the assertive, joyous, but also dangerous Calach Bearer. I'm glad we're releasing this one in summertime. She's a lot milder mannered at this time of year. Yes, Calach Bearer, we hope you accept this bottle as tribute. Please do not destroy Scotland with icy blasts if you are displeased. Nice lines. Good likeness. Do you think she'll like it? Yes, I really do. Excellent. Would you like to open it? I think I was hoping to keep this one until winter, just in case it's a little more severe than we were expecting. Probably wise. So for all of you out there, this limited run of Scottish Folklore third release will be available on the Cask 88 online store and through our friends at Whiskey Foundation from tomorrow, the 16th of July, 2020. Links below, of course. And if you want to get in there just a bit earlier, VIP access to this bottle is opening right now for Cask 88 subscribers. Links below for signing up to that too. Join us, you whiskey nut, you. Calach Bera is a 19-year-old Lefroy finished in Chateau Leoville Lacaz Bordeaux casks. Bit of a rare jewel, honestly. Each one sells for £475, a special whiskey indeed. Grab one before winter rolls around again, and the Calach demands them as royal tribute. This is whiskey worthy of the Queen of Winter. Well, you might not have much in the way of style when it comes to your beard, but your heart is in the right place. Yeah, I could say the same for you. You may look like a bolt of bear as lightning has tried to split your face in two, but you're pretty grounded, really. I'll drink to that. Aye. Cheers, Slangeva. Thank you for watching episode 10 of the Cask 88 lock-in. And it's wonderful to see you still here after the credits have rolled. I'll surmise that to mean that you, like us, also care for the stories behind the whiskey. Now, the stories of the Calach Bearer have reverberated through Scottish, Irish and Manx culture over the centuries. 
And what you've seen today has been a bit of a mashup, a modern continuation of a classic story. Congratulations if you saw through our cryptic clues on social media and guessed the Calach bearer's identity correctly. Someone is going to have an incomparably lovely bottle winging its way towards them very soon. If you enjoy the storytelling aspects of whiskey, or if you've enjoyed the shenanigans you've seen on this show, then let me draw your attention to the back catalogue of episodes we've built up, this modern feat of storytelling, the Cask 88 lock-in. Three months ago, the UK went into lockdown, and that was when we started this show, a light-hearted way of showing off our very real enthusiasm for Scotch whiskey to the world. Hopefully, it's kept you as entertained as it has me during this extended period of not going outside. Through the show, we've also had the chance to interview and welcome some incredible guests, people from within the modern Scotch whisky industry who have brought some raw and real insight into the dedication and love of craft that supports this amazing industry. We've also welcomed supremely talented musical guests who gave us stirring living room performances in lieu of the live shows that we all hope that they can return to soon. Strange circumstances lead to strange ideas, and this show has been a lot of fun to make. Hopefully it's been at least as much fun for you to watch. And I'm looking forward to the next few months where there are more stories to gather and a relaxation of restrictions might mean more interesting locations than just my living room fireside. Ow, hot. I hope you'll be with us along the way. Until then, good health. Slanjava.